Hello, everybody. It is Saturday night at 10 o'clock Eastern time. I am Chris Weave. This is Starfleet Tactical. I am here this week with Lissa, who's behind the scenes, uh, Sean Barnett, uh, a good friend of mine, an old wargaming buddy, and Peter Gold, who you all know as the Merchant Mariner who also does science fiction. Um, just so that we get it all out of the way, anybody here speaking for their employer tonight? Anybody get no. a tradition no. and speak for their employer? No. Okay, it's no. unanimous. None of us are speaking for our employer. And um, I, I, I can't remember if I have any illustrations tonight that fall under the fair use category, because I think everything that I've got in, in there is stuff that we put in there. Uh, actually, I pulled some stuff down from Wikipedia and stuff. And so we're here to critique it and talk about things, et cetera, et cetera. Fair use, fair use, fair use. Um, Sean, you're a lawyer. Did that count? Uh, sounds good to me. Okay, good, good. Okay, so the reason why Sean and Peter are on tonight. So first of all, thank you, everybody, for showing up. It's been a while since we've done one of these because my schedule has been crazy and it's going it's, it's to sort of continue to be crazy. Um, but uh, Sean and I and uh, went and, and P uh, went and looked at Peter's current ship a few weeks ago, and then after that we went and did a tour of the USS Wisconsin. And a month before that, I did a tour of the USS Wisconsin with a bunch of other people that weren't on this tour, including Peter. And so this week the plan is to talk about Peter's current ship and show some pictures and sort of discuss what's going on and, and why you would have it and how what a science fiction equivalent might look like and things like that. And then uh, probably next week, if, if everybody's available, we'll talk about the USS Wisconsin and some of the things that we saw inside the, uh, the USS Wisconsin tour. Um, but um, um, so we, it, was a, it was a whirlwind tour. Uh, Sean and I, I drove to DC, I picked up Sean Spent the night on his couch, picked up Sean. Um, the next morning, we drove to uh, to Norfolk, Virginia, picked up a third friend, Mike DiCarlo. Um, we then went off to the MacArthur Museum, uh, the MacArthur Memorial. 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 Memorial, where we learned that Douglas MacArthur had the power to heal by laying on hands. <laughs> it is, It is, shall we say, not a balanced view of the man. Very heroic view of Douglas MacArthur. Very heroic view of Douglas MacArthur. <laughs> so we, um, we did that. And then the next day in the morning, we did Peter's ship because Peter was on. Um, Peter was working that weekend, living on board the ship. And then in the uh, afternoon, we went and we did the USS Iowa. I'm sorry, the Iowa class ship USS Wisconsin. And then the next morning, we did the Mariner's Museum on our way out of town. We saw all the artifacts from the monitor. So it was a it was a pretty good um, a pretty good trip overall. So, so Sean, what have you been up to this week? Ah, uh, well, uh, this week uh, doing a little work and um, uh, watching some basketball games because it's the NCAA tournament for both the men and the women this weekend. And my Purdue Boilermakers, I'm a Purdue alum, are uh, in it and still alive, having won their game. Uh, Friday night. So I'm hoping that that uh, continues for the next uh, uh, couple weeks, I guess. Yeah, if I remember correctly, the men, the men's Hawkeyes team got eliminated sometime in, in like January. <laughs> but the women are, are, are slated to do very well. They won today yeah. handily. So uh, likewise, uh, they, they should have a good run too. Yeah, I'm still trying to figure out I'm I'm still trying to figure out exactly what the relationship is between me and Caitlin Clark's mom, because we we both went to the same high school. Just right? tell Caitlin. everybody she was your best friend. No, I'm pretty sure that it was one of her sisters that was in my class. Um, but when I see the list of all the aunts, I don't see that girl's name on it. So I think I think maybe she was going by a middle name or something, and I didn't realize that her her grandfather was the freshman uh, counselor. And so like literally the debate team had a little office and Bob Nizzi's office was right next to that office. So I saw her, her grandfather like literally every day for four years. Um, that sounds much. like a good connection to me. 
Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and, and, um, I, the one Nizzy girl in my class, she, she was very nice. I didn't, I don't think I had any classes with her. So, so Peter, how about you? What have you been up to this week? Uh, getting ready, getting my ship ready to do some stuff. All local stuff though. Okay. So, you no, know, um, trying to fix some stuff, getting some paperwork done. So, uh, other than that, um, stuff with the TRMN fan club. Okay. So. Lots of interesting fan club stuff going on. Yeah. So, um, uh, part of the trip to the, when we came down in, uh, January was because, uh, Tom Pope wanted, who was one of the people went on board the ship, um, on board the Wisconsin, Tom wanted to introduce me to, um, Jacob Hollow, who is, um, uh, co-author of, uh, of David Weber. So, um, very, it was very much of an honor verse filled weekend. Um, so it was sort of, I hadn't had one of those in a while. And it was kind of nice to do that. So, um, so my brother Delon, who apparently is the last person to the party is saying, wait, Bob Nizzi is Caitlin Clark's grandfather. Yes. Delon, Bob Nizzi is Caitlin Clark's grandfather. Caitlin Clark's mother was, I think, Ann Nizzy, and I'm not sure what class she was in, because all the all the bio stuff doesn't doesn't say which class she was in. Um, for all I know, maybe that's Patty, and, and her first name's really Ann, and she went by Patty or something. I don't know, uh, but Patty, I think, was the girl in my class. So, in any event, um, uh, let's see one one quick little thing I want to talk about because um, I told TJ I would. So last year, you may recall, we, I, I, I got a room at the science fiction convention, Marcon. Now, Marcon is uh, in Columbus, Ohio. It's a different weekend this year. Um, look up Marcon Science Fiction Columbus 2024. You'll find out that it's not Memorial Day weekend. It's like the weekend before, and it's in a different hotel. And it's not as good a setup. But the plan is that I am going to have uh, a, a room that I got um, and uh, a sort of a hangout space. And so if people want to come, anybody who comes to the con, just walk, walk up to me, say you're a Starfleet tactical watcher and you want to come come join us in our own little con suite. I can't promise that we're going to have, you know, anything other than good conversation. I'm sure we'll we'll bring some food and drink we did last year. We In fact, in fact we actually bought brought way more than we needed last year. Um, but it's, a um, you know, anybody who wants to come and show up, that's great. Um, that's great. And, uh, TJ, the great thing about it is since it's in Columbus, if you wanted to just only go on Saturday, you probably could only go on Saturday for Saturday night and you could, or, you know, go, go after work on Friday and, and go down and, and whatever. So you might not even have to take any vacation days. Um, I'm going to be there starting on Thursday night and then leaving uh, Monday morning. So, okay. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pull up our slides. So, so um, I, I started a consolidated ship slide tour. Uh, so to, to put the, the uh, Henry Martin stuff in there, Harry, Henry or Harry? Harry. Harry Martin, Harry Martin, the ship that, that uh, Peter took me on this three hour tour of one of his previous ships. And he and I talked about it and I forget how many episodes, probably 40 episodes ago now. Um, uh, we did a, a, a long discussion about it. And so um, I'm sort of consolidating it all in one slide deck. But uh, first of all, the obligatory announcements page. So that's what the current Chris schedule centric schedule looks like. Now, Pat is currently learning how to fly an Airbus. And I'm really looking forward to Pat coming on the program and telling me at some point what it's like to fly an Airbus. Because um, Airbuses, of course, are a lot closer to starships than Boeings are in that the Airbus has an, has an automatic system that, that gets a vote and 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 in terms of how the controls work, et cetera, et cetera. So from that standpoint, I'm really looking forward to hearing what it's like to fly the Airbus. Um, but those are sort of the days that I think I'm going to be available. Um, I thought I was going to be available on the 27th, but there's a, it, that's unclear because I start this trip. The, the red part is a, is a trip. Um, and so May gets really, really dicey. And the question is, is my 
May trip going to start before Starfleet Tactical or after? It's either going to start like on that Friday, the 26th, or it's going to start on the 28th. So if it starts on the 26th, there, there won't be a show. So it's looking like we're going to have, a you know, another three shows in a row, another four shows in a row, I mean. And then um, then there's a possibility of no shows for five shows in a row. It sort of depends upon what and definitely there's going to be three that are missing. I'm still thinking about the starting the Exordium book read along. So if you're interested in being part of that read along, um, go ahead and, and, and uh, get the books from the Book View Cafe. If you're not interested in that, just be aware there will be spoilers all over the place. So. OK, so I'm going to start a little bit with some container ship stuff. Just a couple of quick things on container ships. It's the exact same slides that you saw once before um, when we did the Harry Martin episode. And then we're going to talk about the uh, the SS Wright today. And then next time uh, we'll talk about the Wisconsin and I'm going to combine slides or photos from both of the trips on the Wisconsin. <coughs> so let's talk about Lash and CB because Lash and CB are cool. And I think Lash and CB have a lot of uh, possibilities from a science fiction standpoint. Um, the, if you yeah. go ahead, Peter. The Picture on the far right, that looks like the Cape May at the current dock where the right is. And that's the ship that the National Security Maritime folks were talking about. Where is it to bring the stuff to Gaza? Because oh, really? That's, that's that's what our mission was. We did the JLOTS equipment in massive quantities. Okay. <laughs> Now, is, is that a Lash or a CB ship? Um, though, okay, so the two on the right are CB. Okay. And the they, three on the left are Lash. The difference okay. is whether you have a crane or an elevator. Okay, so, and basically these, these are ships that instead of using containers, they use barges that might have containers on them. And the idea is that when you offload them, because they're in barges, they can be floated to wherever they need to be. So they're potentially really, really good for a place that doesn't have a port or like you Correct. need to take up a river or something along yes. those lines. And yes, they they only made a handful of these. And Peter happened to be on both of them, right? One of each. One of actually, each. two of the two sea barges and one of the lashes. Okay. Yeah. C, C, oh. CB actually stands for sea barge. So, so, um, yeah. did you, did, did you like the ships? Were they well designed? Were they well engineered? Were they cool ships? They look cool. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, they were. Um, 850 pound steam plant. So 1970s tech. Um, when I was on the CB, the, we just gotten some major automation upgrades um, to make life actually make the plant more usable. Um, but I've been, I did my cadet cruise on one of the lashes back in the uh, early eighties when they were relatively new. So yeah, the they are. Was they didn't could really drop, the, drop the bar and, and yeah. So, so but um, you could easily imagine, you know, in a science fiction setting, you could easily imagine that this thing is carrying loaded shuttles and you just sort of swap out shuttles when you get there or something like that. Um, a lot of that. Um, or something similar to um, aircraft carrier in space version, because you don't really need a long um, yeah. uh, landing field. I could also see this thing like I can think of other things that would be useful to to launch this way. Although um, in a lot of cases, an amphib is is an equally good answer for launching that type of thing. Yeah. Um, one of the things I want to talk about at some point, um, there's a, uh, a naval engineer I know named uh, Mike Bosworth, um, who um, Sean, of course, knows as well. And um, Mike, when he was Lieutenant Commander Bosworth, 
uh, working at Carter Rock, um, the surface ship design guys. He and some other people did some design studies for something called the carrier of large objects. And the idea was a, a standardized set of C-frames, some of which would be carrying, uh, might, might be what we would recognize as being an aircraft carrier, uh, but some of them also might be carrying things that, that might be closer to say PT boats. And uh, on the list of things to talk about is, I'm, I'm gonna do the talk on La Foudre. Um, people who've been watching the show for a while remember that I bring up La Foudre all the time. La Foudre was a, a French torpedo boat carrier of the very early 20th century, like, you know, 1910, 1915, that, that time frame, um, uh, 1906 or something. Actually, it might even been earlier than that, come to think of it. it might have been the 18, late 1800s. In any event, La Foudre, in the end, um, was not particularly uh, useful. It was very difficult getting getting the torpedo boats in and out of the water in anything that looked like heavy seas. Um, it probably would have been more useful as just a, you know, as a torpedo boat base. So you go to some island someplace and you go into a sheltered cove and now you've got your own torpedo boat base because you brought the, the brought the base with you. Um, the, I think, though, that a big a big factor in the problems with La Foudre is that it was just they were bad torpedo boats. They were they were small. They were slow. They only had one torpedo each. And so you'd look at this thing and go, is the juice worth the squeeze? And the answer was no. If there was some real capability there, it might be. So in any event, I, I'm going to put I, I've got it on the list of things to do to talk about. Chris Carlson's probably going to come on that show. And we'll uh, we'll hammer on the idea of torpedo boat carriers in space uh, one more time because I've only done that topic a couple of times now. So, so there's Lash and CB um, ships that I I think are worth remembering. And here's a couple of books about container shipping. Now Mark Levinson followed it up uh, followed up the box with another one called After the Box. The box is about container shipping and the building of global supply chains. After the box is about the fraying of global supply chains. Um, I have not read that yet, but the box is a fantastic uh, book. And if you want to understand container shipping, you really, really need to take a look at that. Um, now, 90% of everything is more than just container shipping, and it's a lot more of a cultural study of the people who sail on ships in, a, in some very important ways. Um, Peter, have you read George, Rose George's book? Yes, I have. I also put her, I also gave, caused her a lot of confusion when I said I was going to recommend 90% of everything for the science fiction book club. She was like, but it's not science fiction. <laughs> Yeah, that's the sort of thing that might actually cause somebody a, a little bit of fence until they <laughs> until to explain it. <laughs> oh, sorry, I caught that that cold that was been going around. Um, that I got back from from this long trip I took to D.C. Got back about one o'clock in the afternoon, and about seven o'clock I was coughing like this. So, but I'm a lot better now. So in any event, I recommend both these books. They're both very good books. Okay, so let's talk about the right. Um, and so first of all, here's a little bit of background about the right. Um, it's an aviation logistics support ship, which basically the purpose of this ship is if you've got a marine aviation element someplace, you, you can send this ship along to give it extra repair capabilities before everything moves ashore. So it, it basically allows them to bring some, uh, uh, some extra wrench turners and some extra uh, parts and, uh, um, and workshops along with them. And they do it by putting them on this roll-on, roll roll-off ship um, in the form of containerized support modules. If you look in the middle there, you can see the hatch covers. They can lift those up and they can drop containers down. They can also bring in containers from the back. And there's a, there's, how, how high can you stack containers in there? Um, Is that probably four three. Down? Probably three? Oh, no, more than that. No, closer to six. 
Yeah, I would there's, think it's uh, like a couple, there's a couple of different levels. Yeah, in fact, um, yeah. One of the things about about the ship tour is that we weren't able to go around in all the places that we w were able to go around. On, for instance, like like on the Harry Martin, um, because uh, uh, it was an active work site, and there was a few places where Peter said, "Yeah, you can't go any farther than this line." So because there'll be all sorts of insurance implications if you are over there and you get hurt. So so we have it's it's just like when you go to the auto mechanic you can't just go wander back to where your car is. And so um, we didn't get as many pictures as we uh, might otherwise of, of the areas where, where some of the stuff was going on. Some of it, we only got to look at it from a distance. Like for instance, we didn't get to really go out on deck at all um, forward of the pilot house. So, so this is actually a better view than we had on, on the ship while we were there. But you can see it's got a big helipad up front it's got cranes and some uh, places to stack uh, containers, several decks high, going down into the hold. You can't see the stern ramp at the back, but it's got a stern ramp at the back. Yeah, real, real <laughs> narrow one. Yeah, it was it, it was pretty narrow. It was pretty narrow. Um, do you remember how yeah. many containers that I forgot? I was going to put that on the slide. How many containers it can carry? under its various configurations. I want to say it was like 330 some if it was just functioning as a container ship, right? I thought it was 600. 600 and some, it was like, was it 300 when it when it had the support modules or something like that? Or yeah, am I just- like three. Okay. Yeah, 300 or less for, for support position uh, because you got to be able to get into them, which means that limits the, um, the number of You've got to leave a space. Basically, every other one has got to be empty. Every other slot has to be empty to be able to open up the doors. Yeah, that totally makes sense. That totally yeah. makes sense. Yeah, but so here's two of our heroes. I, I we'll see Mike DiCarlo in another oh, picture in just a moment. So this is Pierce side now. Let me, allow me a, a brief sidebar to talk about how much I hate PowerPoint. So <laughs> if you remember from the last time on Harry Martin, um, I was able to find a, a common theme that when I'd use the slide designer, it was a common theme and they all looked alike. Do you think that the slide designer this time would give me a common theme? There, there, sometimes it would give me the, what I wanted. Sometimes it wouldn't. So stylistically, this presentation is all over the place. <laughs> but uh, on the far right-hand side, you can see is where, where we've, we're coming down the, uh, the pier. Um, and you can see there's railroad tracks there so that you can actually bring in heavy gear on a railroad car. And there's Peter leading the way down to the ship. He had to come and let us in because there's a gate at the end of the pier. Um, then the, the middle picture is us getting closer to the ship. And then um, I grabbed specifically the load line drawing there because uh, things like this, you know, professional things like this are fascinating to me. And so, Peter, do you want to explain what load lines are? Sure. Okay, so the load line is how deep into the water you can send the hull safely. Um, so the numbers on the on the right side of the, of the slide for this ship are painted in feet. It is one foot between each number. And so you can go to, if you're going into the winter North Atlantic, you can ballast, you can load cargo until you've, you're 33 feet deep. Um, if you're going tropical freshwater, well, I guess that would be the, like the Amazon, you can go to 35 feet, um, and it all has to do with salinity and weather. Um, so there's, there's, let's see, winter North Atlantic, summer, tropical, fresh, and tropical fresh. Um, and then the A, B, the A and the B stand for American Bureau of Shipping, and that's basically the, the symbol for um that's what a load line that's that's how you know it's the load line as opposed to the, the one on the right technically is the plimsoll mark okay uh, so there's a... oh go ahead go ahead 
yeah, design 100, 150 years ago to make sure that ships didn't get overloaded and sink. Yeah, there's a very interesting YouTube channel called something like Maritime Disasters or something like that. Um, and uh, a surprisingly large number of episodes of the Maritime Disasters channel can be summarized as they totally jacked up calculating these numbers. Yeah. Um, and and usually with great loss of life. Um, so, yeah, it's it's it. There's a lot of tragedy on that channel. So Sean took these pictures as we were walking up. Sean actually took more pictures than I did on this one. Um, I took a few, but Sean took a lot. So I can't, you know, Peter, I've been trying to think of what's the science fiction equivalent of load lines. Um, and I can, you know, I can think of like you, you need to do, you need to balance your mass and you need to, there's a limit in how much mass you can take. Um, but I don't know of a particular equi environmental equivalent of this. Um, I, I'm not coming up with one. No. Um, make sure your your mass is depending upon how your system works in terms of center of center of mass for th for center of thrust. Yeah. Well, so you don't want to um, have things have your ship go like this accidentally start doing turns as you is you're pushing off center. Um, so, total mass to make sure you get the right, you can use the right acceleration. Um, uh, so like Nathan Lowell's solar clipper series, mass, mass weight is a big factor so they can get underway and actually make speed. You know, the yeah. sails can only handle so much load and you know, if the ship goes too slow, you'll never, you won't make port in a reasonable time frame, or you just yeah. won't be able to move. Those, those of you who've been watching the channel for a while know that uh, my my philosophy on these sorts of things is not that if you're writing science fiction, that the right answer is just to simply take a uh, surface navy or submarines or whatever and and sort of file off the serial numbers, run it through the science fiction converter and put in space on the end. Um, but understanding things like this, understanding the details about how maritime ships work will frequently give you some insight into the type of issues that might come up even in with, with spacecraft. And so um, it's a good starting point for when you're sort of trying to figure out what's important and what isn't and how everything fits together. It's a good starting point to sort of uh, uh, take you to that place. Um, and some of it translates reasonably well. Um, I can make a really good argument that the FTL shelf in the 2300 uh, role playing game, which is basically the effects of gravity wells, um, is actually reasonably similar, similar in some ways to some of the effects of shallow water. Um, a lot of people don't appreciate that water depth has some serious um, uh, constraints on, on things like speed, not just in terms of draft, but, but actually in terms of what you can do um, in shallow water um, because the ship pushes the water out of the way, and as a result, the ship how it's floating changes. Um, and also pressure will bounce off the seafloor and come back up at you. And so um, it's very interesting. All right, let's move on. Okay, so I may have mislabeled some of these, Peter. So yes. if I have, is, That's is all this the one unlicensed good? lounge? Unlicensed, unlicensed lounge. lounge. Yeah. Okay, so what I'm doing, I'm actually changing this in the um, in the master in real time, so that the next time I do this, I've got it right. <laughs> okay, so this is the unlicensed lounge. Um, so, yeah. So, so what is what is what do you mean by unlicensed? It's sort of the equivalent of enlisted. Uh, they haven't had to take a a license exam, which is uh, fairly comprehensive. Um, they've taken exams from the Coast Guard to earn specific qualifications. Um, 
and but they they haven't taken such a huge variety necessarily um, to be qualified technically in, in everything for one department. So my original license said uh, third assistant engineer, motor, steam, any horsepower, and then my merchant merchant mariner's card Z card said any rating any unlicensed rating engine room so i could sail as electrician machinist um anything like that so, okay yeah so um this actually from a science fiction standpoint i've never been a big fan of the illiterate dockyard worker goes to space genre. Um, this is actually one of the problems I have with David Drake's uh, uh, takeoff on the Matron Aubrey books. Um, the Royal Cinnabar Navy stuff is because it's just got a little bit too much of of guys being press ganged um, because you know anybody off the street you just need a strong back sort of stuff. Um, but uh, how many unlicensed are there on a ship like this? Uh, let's see. You got a crew of thirty-seven, I think it said. Thirty-nine, I thought. Okay. But plus, um, let's see. Probably twenty-nine, twenty-five to twenty-nine unlicensed. Okay. Um, because there's there's one officer on each watch plus a couple of day working officers. You know, like the chief engineer and the master are all day workers. The first and the chief mate are probably day workers, um, just because we I know we have two third engineers and a second, and those are those would be watch standers. So a day worker just means that they don't stand a watch. Correct. Correct. They work um, nominally eight to five plus overtime either before or after or if need be in the middle of the night if something if there's a crisis so that that's similar to how the navy does it um like on a on a destroyer um i'm pretty sure the chief engineer doesn't stand a watch i know that the the co and the xo don't stand watches right because um, they're um, basically considered to be working all the time and the thing is, they have to be, they're free safeties, right? So they get to roam wherever they're needed to be. And so you can't have a situation where one of them is trapped in a particular location because if he leaves, then the watch is not covered. Right. Yeah, it, it was my impression. I want to talk to probably Joelle about it um, because I think she was the SWO. Um, the junior officers have, have worked during the day, but then they're on a, a watch rotation that has nothing to do with their day job. Um, yes. So, you know, they may be working all day and then they've got to get some sleep because, because they have the midnight to 4 a.m. watch and then they're going to work all, the next day. Then they don't have another watch for a couple of days. That That's not just the officers. That's basically the entire crew. Okay. Yeah, um, that's probably one reason they have um, sleep issues. Yeah, yeah, they sometimes do. Um, that I think they're getting better about that. It used to be that it was just considered like, oh, you need sleep. You, that That is just weakness. We don't do weakness in the Navy, so you don't need sleep. Now, um, now I, I did have uh, one of my students when I was a professor at the War College, one of my students who was a lieutenant commander at the time, he's now, uh, and he went to a merchant marine academy, um, and, but ended up commissioning in the Navy. His comment was that, you can get plenty of sleep as long as you prioritize sleep as the number one thing that you need to do when you're not working. And so he didn't watch any movies in the, in the wardroom. He, he didn't do any of that other stuff. If he went, if he had time that he was, if he had downtime, he went and slept and he said he, he didn't have any sleep issues at all. Um, now, okay, that, that, that's all well and good, but you know, there, there's reasons why you do stuff with the wardroom, right? There's reasons why you, you get together with, the, with all your comrades in arms and do stuff too. So, yeah. um, 
excuse me. So, um, Sean, is there? Yeah. So, as we were going through the ship, were you were you seeing what you expected to see? Um, I I guess I mean the the stuff related to the handling of containers and the. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the flight deck and such. I, I had never been on the ship before, and I hadn't looked at it online beforehand or any photos. So I was uh, open-minded about what we were going to see. I will say that the uh, the crew's living spaces look somewhat similar to the living spaces on the battleship Missouri that I toured out in Hawaii uh, a year ago. And, uh, you know, a little bit later technology, but, you know, a bunk bed is a bunk bed. And so there was some similarity there. Yeah, we'll, we will get to that soon enough. Um, okay, so here's so here's something I have labeled mess. Did I get that right? Officer's mess. Officer's mess, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, and then and the serving line. Uh, upper right-hand corner is the galley serving line. And when the ship was built... I suspect they had one unlicensed guy whose job it was to go up to the serving line, get the food for the officers, and bring it back to their tables. <laughs> yeah, that would be consistent. Um, now, uh, I haven't been at sea since November of 2004, so we're coming up on 20 years. Um, but in the wardroom, that's how it always ended up working, right? You, you sat down and they, in, in this case, they'd have a little piece of, of paper and you'd sort of fill out what you wanted and someone would bring it to you. Um, yeah, yeah. We've gotten away from that. They, they decided to save money on the on labor costs. So officers go up and get their own food. You know, and it. I, I actually I would prefer to get my own food if if especially if you're going to do something that looks like a serving line, um, so I, I know that on, at least on one of the aircraft carriers, they sort of uh, switched it from sort of sit down they bring the food to you eating in all of the wardrooms they switched it to the serving line sort of uh, style that they had in wardroom number one, uh, aka the dirty shirt. It's called the dirty shirt because you didn't have to clean, change into a clean uniform and you could wear occupational clothing. So you could wear like a flight suit or or uh, or something like that. You didn't have to change into good clothes for it. And it wasn't a formal sit down meal. And the, basically the uh, the uh, the wardroom on the ship. So wardroom in the Navy means two different things. Wardroom can be a physical place. Wardroom can refer to the collection of officers. So it's sort of like, um, it's like the club and the club can either be the place or it can be the members of the club. So the wardroom as a, as a unit sort of voted to not have the sit down uh, served meal because it was just faster to go through the line. And they said, we, we, we prioritize speed over, you know, elegance, right? So, yeah, especially when you're having trouble finding junior sailors, um, you know, you don't necessarily have to have somebody that's just going to wait on you hand and foot. Yeah. And um, one thing you might notice here, everybody, uh, the two lower pictures, they've got the these bunk seats with the possibility of putting chairs up on the other side. But um, I think you said, Peter, that the chairs are probably in storage someplace. Yes, probably. Which totally and completely makes sense to me, right? They're just in the way if they're not being used. And um, if you get underway with a, a smaller crew, a chair, it's just something that can sort of, you know, slip around on, on sea state. Although na maritime chairs are pretty good about not just sliding all over the place. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. The other thing, of course, is that this this was this was designed not just for the probably 10 or 12 officers, but also the up to the 12 passengers you'd carry on board. Oh, yeah, that's actually a good point, because this ship started out as a as a civilian ship without a military mission, right? Correct. This was a this was a combined uh, row row and passenger ship, um, which I, I 
meant to mention at the very beginning, because that is a, in my mind, that's a very science fiction thing. Um, that's something that you don't, that you don't see like you used to, but it makes sense to me that in, under certain sets of science, uh, science fiction assumptions, that the idea that you'd be carrying passengers and cargo makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I mean, if you're not, if you don't have an awful lot of traffic going someplace, but you have, um, it's not so isolated that it's all charters. Um, you know, okay, we're going to carry 12 or 20 or whatever number the, the author decides is the standard maximum. Um, and from a story writing prospect, you've got the ability there to, um, you know, you can swap out characters because they're just the passengers. Yeah. Or the passengers are going someplace, the troubleshooters for company, and they're changing ships all the time. You, you swap out all the crew. Yes, and they have a mysterious backstory. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, so. we, yeah, we saw that in Full Share where the, the passenger turned out to be the owner of the company that Ishmael was being hired by. He oh, yeah. He didn't realize that until much later. <laughs> that, that was Lissa tossing out something. That Yeah, yeah. There's a, there's a lot of potential there. There's a lot of potential there. Okay, so moving on because we're running uh, running behind. There's an elevator. We all took the elevator. Yeah. It was an elevator. Not something you usually see on ships, but it was an it was an elevator in it, and you could not fit an airplane on it. Um, just a couple of passageways and ladders. Now, the only thing that's really noticeable about this is that now, do you guys would you call that a ladder? Or would you call it stairs? Probably a ladder. Okay, because um, ladder is a navy term, or uh, uh, frequently they're called ladders, and they're stairs, but they're really really steep. These weren't particularly steep. These were just not, sort of regular. Not there. nearly as steep as the ones on the battleships. No, the ones on the battleship are very steep. The ones on the battleship are very steep. Okay, so this was just up on the wall. Uh, and it's got a breakdown of the various decks of the ship. Um, that's all uh, stuff in the, uh, the... What would you call the structure at the rear of the ship that has the pilot house on the top? Um, well, that'd be the, the house, the house. Okay. Yeah. Living, living area. Okay. So that bit in the back is the house. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, um, there's some good videos online that talk about why some ships have their conning all the way aft and some ships have it all the way forward and what the implications of that are and why you'd want to do it one over the other. I mean, the advantage of having it aft is that is that you've got short control runs. You Everything's in one place. You've got the uh, pilot house at the top, the bridge, and you've got engineering underneath it. And, you know, it's all in one structure. Getting from one part of, the, part of that uh, area to another is very easy. On the other hand, if you've got a cargo that you pile up on the deck, you can't really see the bow. And so in some ships, depending upon what the ship is, you might have a pilot house all the way forward. Um, and I think it's casual navigation, if I remember correctly, is the YouTube channel that he goes through and he talks about all those ship design stuff like that. Um, and that that also is another one of those things where whenever I think about that, I sort of think about, OK, how does this how would this apply to spacecraft? How would this apply to spacecraft? Yeah. The other advantage nowadays, especially is or to be considered is if you put the house in one location where are you putting the engine room and how far, how how easy yeah. or how hard is it to access between the two yes yeah um, I mean, in this case in this case you just go down go down a, a set of stairs you know multiple decks right it's not like yeah. they're right next to each other but but they are um they are close enough that you can get to it the this, this is sort of the equivalent of the primary hall, where's the engine room discussion from a few episodes ago. Yes. Yeah. So like if you go back to the lash or the sea barge, um, the engine room is midships. 
the living quarters or the bridge rather specifically is all the way forward. Okay. So to go to the engine room, you had a uh, quite a walk in some ways. Oh, I bet. I bet. Yeah. So luckily they had an interior <laughs> tunnel system. So you didn't have to go out on deck to get to get to the engine room if, if there was heavy weather. That's good. That's very good. Because I understand weather can get bad at sea. Yes. Okay. So here we are in the pilot house looking uh, generally forward. Um, and uh, there is a uh, tell us about the periscope. Oh, yeah, that's is how you look at the magnetic compass that's above the, the pilot house uh, or above the bridge. And so if your electronics, if your electrical stuff for your gyro compass fails, you know, it's an electromechanical system, um, you can always look at the magnetic compass, which is um, purely physical. And the thing about uh, magnetic compasses is that when you put them in an object that's largely made out of metal, you have some constraints that you have to live with. Yeah. And so, so if you've ever, anybody who's ever seen pictures of old compasses on bridges of ships, there's always these, these two great big metal balls next to them. That's calibration stuff. Right, you move the balls, move around to balance out the magnetic field so that you get the right. Uh, so, so when it tells you north, it really is north. Yeah, or well, yeah, what would normally be north for that specific location? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because... I guess you were futzing with those all the time. No, no, no. Um, you set them up once, and you should never have to touch them. But if you're even set... if you do like a like a cross pacific run correct wouldn't wouldn't touch him what okay because the the nautical chart will tell you what the magnetic deviation is for that part of the ocean oh and, oh oh okay okay yeah yeah you make the correction on the charts you fix it in hard you fix it in software not in hardware yes yes okay that makes a lot more sense yeah yeah so yeah so Stephen Ross says ship schematics on the wall. Well, Star Trek got that right. Yeah, I think that's really, there's there's ship schematics all over the place, especially on aircraft carriers, because an aircraft carrier is so damn big that there's lots of you are here signs all over the place. And that's especially true of like the um, especially important in like some of the, the, the older aircraft carriers, all of which are decommissioned now. Because they had, it was a lot more maze-like, I, I thought. Now, I had a, most, almost all of my time was on Nimitz's. I only had 36 hours on Constellation. But I could just barely uh, get to where I needed to be on Constellation. And it was only because I sort of memorized specific routes. Whereas Nimitz's are much more, seem to be much more like, like if you're on this deck, this always goes through. There is a few places where it's like, you need to know, don't take the left ladder, take the right ladder instead, because the, the one on the left go only goes down one deck, the one on the right, you, you go through a bulkhead, and there's another ladder right on the other side. It, it will go down three decks to where you want to go, which is, incidentally, the 7-Eleven. Um, so there's the pilot house looking to port. And so the, the, on, the image on the right is actually at the back of the pilot house, the windows looking forward or, or to the right of us there? Yes. Yeah. So you're looking out to the port bridge wing. Yes. And so here's the pilot house looking starboard. Yeah. Now, Sean took a picture of me standing in front of that wheel. I did not include that. Yeah. So when we went out of the bridge wing, we could see some other ships. We saw specifically the U.S. has uh, Mahan. That was looking okay. Mahan was looking fine. Um, Vicksburg, on the other hand, Vicksburg has some issues. <laughs> um, oh, the... Vicksburg was stripped of all of her radars. Um, and apparently, for, I heard from some other people, um, uh, when we went to um, the Wisconsin tour, 
Greg Whitaker was saying that Vitz, because Vicksburg was one of his ships, um, that Vitz, Vicksburg had enough problems that they were worried about hull integrity. Ooh. So Vicksburg is, is, is she's done. She's done. And so she was just sitting across. And then this other ship, USNS Montford Point, is brand spanking new. And it is an ESD is what they're currently calling it. And um, we'll talk a little bit more about these at some point in the future. But um, it's, it's hard to see it from here. But what you're seeing is a large flat deck that you can bring LCACs up on and some covered area where you can put uh, containers um, so that you're undercover. And there's a couple of different variations of this ship, including one that has a flight deck all the way across. And so uh, they just commissioned the USNS John Canley. It's got the, uh, the as the CO said, that's got the third largest flight deck in the fleet. And I'm hoping that the CO at some point will come and say that on this show. He's already said a couple of times he's more than willing to come on. It's it's all about me getting my act together. The CO wow. is a Navy captain named Thomas Mays, who uh, some of you might recognize as the author of the science fiction novel, A Sword into Darkness, which is an utterly fantastic science fiction novel. And Tom keeps getting promoted. And so I think, I haven't really asked him about this, but I think that Tom expected that he was going to be done with his Navy career about six or seven years ago because he figured he'd probably put in his 20 years and get to commander and he'd be done. But they kept promoting him. And so um, um, so his latest job is he's the the commander of this, this brand spanking new ship that just commissioned. And it's sort of a, a, a support ship, et cetera. And because it's got a, a huge area for gear, and they can, they've got a, a, a reconfigurable mission space and they can bring modules on board and they can be doing humanitarian assistance one week and special forces, special mission support the next week. And so uh, those of you who've been watching the show for a while um, uh, probably understand exactly how excited that made me sound when I heard about all that. <laughs> so I discovered that there's a limitation in StreamYard you can't have a presentation like this that's lot bigger than 50 megabytes. And so we will switch to the other file that has the rest of the presentation. So here we've got uh, our intrepid visitors in the CO office and stateroom. Oh, be masters. Masters, you're right, you're right, you're right. Yeah. I, I knew that, I knew that. <laughs> yeah. So... What's the difference between a master and a CO? Explain that to us, please. Um, mostly legal. Um, the Merchant Marine, it's the master of a vessel. Um, it covers, and it's both a billet and a rank. Um, there's some oddities when it comes to how big the ship is, but they're still the master. There's just limitations as to what they have to have. Um there, there's actually a similar thing on the Navy side. Like, for instance, I said that that uh, Tom was the CO. He's the commanding officer, but he is not the master of that ship. Right. Um, right. So he's the mission commander. Um, but he is not the master of that ship. And they also have a blue and a gold crew. So they can swap guys out if they need to. And and um, um, and and, you know, so they can they can. Do longer ops. Oh, that, by the way, in the middle there is Mike DiCarlo. So I, I promised you pictures of Mike. Um, and in the photo below, Mark, uh, Mike, you have the uh, the ship's gun locker. Yep. So, which we did not access. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So on the right hand side, uh, that door you're looking through goes right into the master stateroom. In fact. Uh, that door is just to the right of Sean uh, off, off screen there. Um, and, and you can see the curtain for that window, right? The, the curtain for that window. Um, and there was just a couple of, you know, plastic lawn chairs out there. Uh, if you rotated 90 degrees to the left, uh, you were looking out on this section of deck and you can see the lifeboat there. Marine officer stateroom, is that correct? 
Yes. Now, yep. for the record, this is two different rooms that I'm looking at here. Um, I just took pictures and threw them on. These are not the same room. There's there's like two two photos from each. Um, uh, and it sort of cropped some of it, which makes it a little bit, you, you'd see that that big table. Uh, it's like a draftsman's table that they had in there for some reason. Um, that's in one of the other photos, but it cropped it. And so they, it looks like they get, they had a, a couple of officers per, but they had a pretty good uh, uh, size room. Now, remember, this used to be a passenger ship. Um, so this is not standard regulation size. They just sort of threw some bunks and into a room that was already there. And so I think the one, the larger, weirder shaped of them, uh, Peter was speculating might have been like the passenger's lounge um, previously. No, other side. We haven't gotten to it yet. Oh, okay. I know, I'm, I'm thinking that these are just big passenger rooms. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. I misremembered. Yeah. Now <laughs> that's the pass. That's the that's the lounge. The old oh, lounge. okay. Okay. Yes. Now there was there was more than one medical facility, which struck me as kind of weird. One for the one was the probably the old one for the crew. Um, and, then the, and then the new one for for because you've got a lot more people on board. Yes. Okay. And so you see that there's a treatment room. The the second one from the right is a is a treatment room. And then I think all three of the other ones are are actually birthing areas in sick bay, right? So if you got people that are sick or injured, this is where they this is where they recover. And then you've got a treatment room. Yeah. Okay, so that's from the bridge wing looking forward. You can just kind of make out the helipad there forward of the cranes. You can see the area on the deck that's that's covered, but but there you can you can put um, uh, containers into these wells in in the front and get them down uh, multiple decks down. If you turn around and look aft, there's the lifeboat. And if you remember everybody from the Harry Martin one, um, I had a bunch of photos of Peter and I inside the lifeboat, seeing what the inside of a lifeboat looks like. So, but but as it was, we did not go and look inside the lifeboat in this case. And, um, okay, so here's the marine living area. And so it's just sort of multiple, you know, rows of, uh, of lockers and bunks. And at the end, there's a gun rack and there was gun racks on, along some of the sides. And what you're seeing in that gun rack, first of all, in the upper left-hand corner, you're seeing a chair. For some reason, there's a chair hanging from the gun rack. There was a bunch of chairs hanging from the gun rack. On the right-hand side, what you're seeing uh, on the right of the of each, each of those individual horizontal bars is a space for one gun. On the right-hand side, there is a place to stick the stock of the gun, uh, like a box it sticks into. And on the left-hand side, there is a lock designed to close over the barrel and lock it in place. So when you put it in there and turn that lock, that, that, that gun can't be removed. And so the Marines bring their personal weapons with them, but most of the time they're busy being uh, helicopter mechanics. They're not, they're not doing the every man a rifleman thing just then. So Marine Officers Lounge? Yep. Yeah, uh, or, or all of the officers recreation lounge. With Marine Corps logo. Yeah, well, they got to mark their space. Yeah, they do do that. So you yeah. think this is all of the officers? I think so. Um, not having been there when it's, when it's active. Um, the other thing that's happened over the decades is people officers tend to either they get off work after having worked not only in eight hour day plus some overtime and they just want to shower and go to sleep or um nowadays they have a tv in their room and videos and such so they just sort of chill out there yeah um, i can see that yeah which is sort of a pity because even when i was a cadet it was People were in the um, in the evening. They were in their rooms. You might sometimes get invited to somebody's room to uh, talk with them, but 
Um, there wasn't a lot of, uh, unlike some of the other ships I've been on, where the common space was actually used by the officers in the evening. So, yeah, I can see that. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. So um, ubiquitous electronics has sort of ruined it for everybody. In some ways, um, there was actually an article. I haven't had a chance to read it, but I talked to the author briefly on Twitter. Um, there's like two designs for merchant ships. One is you have real small rooms and you encourage everybody to spend as little time in their personal room and instead go to the uh, public lounge or you go the other way around. It's a real small public lounge and everybody goes to the room and, and uh, does whatever they want to do there. Yeah, I mean, if you think about how, think about 10 forward. Yeah. Right? 10 forward was almost always at least half full. Um, that was, so th there's an interesting commentary there about is, does this say something about the sense of community in the Federation? Right, that people want to go and spend time with other people as opposed to just going off to the room. When if you look at the average stateroom on board Enterprise D, oh my God, it's bigger than my apartment. Yeah. Yeah. So but that that that's another one of those things to sort of think about when you're doing world building is you know what you know, how plugged in are people with each other? What does community look like? Yeah, that could be a really good one. Yeah. 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 I mean, and I could, I could see situations where, where it's like, it's very limited what they, you know, there, there's a, there's an explicit sense of trying to go off and do stuff with other people. But on the flip side, you know, first of all, um, I'm sure there are introverts in the audience right now that are screaming into their pillow at that slot. Um, uh, that the idea that the company would make you interact with other people. And um, the other uh, thing that's, you know, it's like, okay, uh, how, how, how do you actually make that work? Right. How do you make it not be forced fun? Right? Um, yeah. I mean, you know, if you're a book reader and, or, and like to sleep, you know, a small bed, a small stateroom with just basically room for a bed, who cares? You know, you, you take a shower, you crawl into bed and you, you fall asleep with a book in your, on your face. <laughs> Yeah, yeah I, I mean, I've done, I've done that. I, I've, I've, I've had apartments where I for uh, ignored the master bedroom, and uh, made my bedroom one of the small rooms because my thought of uh, is if you're if you're in your bedroom, you spend ninety five percent of your time in your bedroom on the bed, and so why do I need all this extra space? Yeah, as long as I've got space for my dresser and stuff like that, I don't need the rest of it. <clears throat> okay. Um, so these are just, this is like the chief engineer's office, right? Um, yes. Yes. So, and as you can tell, this is a position that is occupied. <laughs> yep. yep. <laughs> so uh, my guess is there's a stateroom off to one side here that I'm not seeing, or is that tr not? It is. It's off to the uh, to the left, basically. Okay. Um, that's that's something that uh, Navy ships share in common is that the frequently the officers uh, work at a desk in their room um, because they have their own room, so they can they can work at a desk in their room, whereas the enlisted folk uh, do not have uh, a room of their own. So so like the. Uh, the chief and all the enlisted folk are working in the, the office for whatever department they're in, but the officer is someplace else, which has the added advantage of getting the officer away from them so that they can do their job. Yeah. So, yeah. In, the, in this case, the officers, the, so the chief engineer and the, and the master will both have a, their own office off of directly connected to their stateroom. Mm -hmm. Um, Everybody, any other officer that needs office space will work from someplace, will have access to, well, depends upon the ship, I should say. Um, okay. the, the ship I was on before this, 
I had a an office off of my stateroom. Not that I ever used it for anything really. Mm-hmm. Um, some ships that that same ship before it came over to um, where it is now. The chief engineer was expected to work in the ship's office, which was described as a real pain in the neck because if he wanted to get up in the middle of the night to check his email, he had to get fully dressed. Yeah. As opposed to being able to close the office door, open the door between the bedroom, the state, the bedroom and the, and the office and just go, you know, putter about in his um, sweatpants. Yeah, I can see that being a problem. Yeah. One Horse Shea says, if anything, the Enterprise D went with a large rooms and a small lounge for 10 forward as the ship had a crew of 1,000, and how many could that hold at a time? That's a good point. Um, I expect that that's not the only lounge on board that ship for exactly that reason. Yeah. So here's the uh, cargo uh, cargo area and loading. And so um, as uh, Peter previously said, it's fairly narrow. Um, it's kind of hard to see, but in the upper left-hand corner, what you're looking at is sort of a, a if I remember correctly, it's like a side bay area. Um, uh, there was a couple of places where there was effectively sort of like a cutout in the side, and one of them had a machine shop and stuff in it. Another one looked like it was sort of storage area, and uh, that's how that was kind of set up. Um, but you can sort of see that there's scaffolding there. So we didn't go to any of the areas that had scaffolding. We stopped at, at whatever the barrier was and didn't, didn't enter the uh, space with the scaffolding. Um, uh, thoughts, comments about this? No, the, the upper left-hand corner, um, you re I'm not sure if you can actually tell, but the, above those forklifts is a cargo hatch that you could lift up lift up and also below them is they're sitting on a cargo hatch. So you can fill that whole space with containers. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, if you sort of make, make the picture bigger, you can see that. Yeah. It, it was interesting to me to see the space where they could actually drive vehicles uh, onto the ship, how big that was or how small that was, you know, and, and they're thinking of, uh, you know, what they wanted to be able to do uh, in the, uh, you know, in its row row capacity. Yeah, you could probably get a, a Humvee on here, but that's about it. Yeah, because, I mean, if you look at that middle one, that's that's the limiting factor, right? That's the limiting factor. Yeah. And, and that's um, – uh, it's not small, right? Um, no. But it's also not huge. Yeah, compared um, to the Martin. Yeah, the Martin was a double wide. Oh, uh, maybe triple. Yeah. I mean, you could put an M1A1 up the up the ramp of the Martin easily. I mean, you almost may have been able to, be able to do two. <laughs> yeah, and um, so that's that's actually that sort of reminds me of one of the things I wanted to say about ships versus airplanes. Um, as a general rule, now load lines notwithstanding, as a general rule, airplanes will mass out before they cube out, and ships will cube out before they mass out. What do I mean by that? An airplane, you, you, if you look at uh, pictures of stuff inside airplanes, you frequently see, you'll see like one or two vehicles in the very center of the airplane and a lot of empty space. And that's because it's a weight limit. Um, things like armored vehicles are dense. Yes. Yeah. So it's a weight limit. And so you run out of weight before you run out of space. Ships as a general rule. I mean, yeah, there's there's heavy stuff and you've got load lines. And so there's a limit on what you can put on there. But unless you're like loading iron pellets um, or something really, really heavy like that, you're probably going to run out of space before you run out of mass. There are, of course, exceptions, load yeah. lines. Right. Um, but but as a general rule, you know, the, the concerns are different. You still have to load a ship correctly. There's plenty, plenty of uh, ship disaster videos that basically boil down to they did a really sloppy job of loading the ship. And as a result, when they hit heavy weather, it put the, the stresses on the hull in the wrong way. And that's why the ship is now in two pieces. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. So like if you're up on the Great Lakes, if you're carrying iron or taconite, you will mass out before you vo before you um, yeah. run out of space. If you're running, if you're doing coal, you'll run out of volume before you run out of mass before you hit your load line. Yeah, and one of the things that, that one of the things that makes taconite so dangerous is because since you've massed out, it means your cargo holds still have a lot of space in them. And so if you haven't done a good job with your hatch covers and you're in heavy weather and you start flooding, there's still plenty of space for water to get in yeah. and fill up. Um, there, the uh, Great Lakes stuff is interesting because basically you, there's all sorts of limits throughout the world on ship size based upon where the ship needs to go. So if you need to go through the Suez Canal, there's a certain limit. If you want to go through the Panama Canal, there's a limit, although that limit has now changed because they've opened new locks in the canal. I mean, this is the reason why U.S. battleships were 108 feet wide, because the locks were 110 feet wide. Um, and in the Great Lakes, you've got, and I forget exactly what they call the limit, but it's it's basically the locks at Sault Ste. Marie, if I remember correctly. Is that right, Peter? Yes. Yes. And so which those locks are relatively narrow, which, <coughs> which means that if you know what you're looking for, you can look at a picture of a ship and say, that's a Great Lakes ship. Yeah. And <coughs> somebody who doesn't know what they're looking for goes, how can you tell? And the answer is it's long and thin. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. The downbound ships going through, through the Sioux locks, they will run 18 inches under the keel. Yeah. Yeah. Up for, you know, and it's rock underneath. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. So, so now that that's another, <laughs> that's another thing that when you run it through the science fiction converter, well, you know, where can you run that through the science fiction converter? A few places, if you've got something that looks like a Stargate, um, both in like Stargate SG-1, there was a limit on how big a ship could be to go through a Stargate. Um, there's a guy named uh, John Lumpkin, who these days is the CEO of a computer game company. And I, I can't remember the name of the computer game company, but they made a big splash a few years ago. But John wrote a couple of books um, through Struggle of the Stars, and I can never remember the name of the second one. And in those universe, <laughs> his universe, <clears throat> interstellar travel is through wormholes that are created in pairs, and then one end of the wormhole is put on an unmanned ship that carries it to another star system. So it's an unmanned uh, ram augmented rocket or something like that, interstellar ramjet, that takes one end to the other system. And then you pump mass through it to make it bigger. And then eventually you get to something that's about, I can't remember exactly what he said the uh, uh, the limit was, but, but in human space, they always aim for a specific size so that you never have to worry about one hole being smaller than another in that regard but that that sort of sets the limit on how big your ship can be is that the the size of the wormhole and then they put a metal ring around it to basically mark where the wormhole is and to provide electronics etc cetera, etc cetera, to you know beacons and stuff like that um and and to sort of hold it in place um it's actually a very nice series i need to i need to contact john i haven't talked to john in a in a few years now um, I need to get in touch with him and ask him if he'd be willing to come on the show because it's a fantastic series. And I really hope he reads, he, he, he did two thirds of a trilogy. I hope he does the third one eventually. Okay, so more cargo. And so if you look at the one on the left, you can see that there's a big hole in the deck and that, and above it there's doors and that's so that you can, you can actually lower uh, containers all the way down. Uh, the next one from the left, you can see there's a door there, and that's uh, uh, that door swings down into place and locks off the, the hold, right? Yes. Watertight integrity issues. 
And then uh, the last two sort of show one of those, uh, you can see the side bay off to one side that I was talking about earlier. Yeah. Okay, so this is the format that I wanted PowerPoint to give me because this is the one that the Harry Martin is in and this is the only slide that it would give me this format. Of. <laughs> so this is the engineering control station stuff. And as you can see, um, Scotty's got nothing on Peter here. <laughs> the number of switches in his engineering plant. Yeah. Lots We've eliminated of a lot. We went um, we, we went digital a number yeah. of years ago. Now, all that open space used to be switches, little, little rocker switches and, and push buttons and lights and such. I can believe it. I can yeah. believe it. But I mean, this is a very, very interesting plant. We're going to spend some time talking about it when we talk about the Wisconsin, because it this is also a steamship, just like the Wisconsin is. And uh, Peter and I were talking the other day about about uh, how many people you need, like how many people on a watch do you need to run this plant? This one, two. OK, I think we concluded that for each of the four boiler room, engine room combinations on the Wisconsin, we thought it was around 40 per, right? 40 per watch? Per Probably. It, it's, it's big. It's big. And there's literally a guy, I am not kidding, there's literally a guy who has a big valve wheel and he's looking at a little gauge and he wants it 50% 50% water and he opens and he closes and he opens and he closes. And that's what he does for four hours at a time. Why four hours? Because it's 115 degrees in that space and, and four hours is really kind of the limit. Yeah. And so think about how many to have one guy doing that. You know, there's got to be six watches of just open and close and so peter's doing it all with two guys which means he needs what how how long a watch would you normally stand four hours either four or six depending upon which which system you're using how many watch sections would you have three okay so they're on a on a rotation so you need six guys yeah three officers coach. three unlicensed yeah. Yeah. So isn't modern technology wonderful? A little yeah. bit of automation helps. And it's a more efficient steam plant, too, because it's a higher pressure steam plant. Yeah. So yeah. we'll talk more about steam plants later on. Um, and there's, uh, is that the turbine in the middle one? Yes. Okay. So there's a turbine single screw uh, ship. Um, yes. all, the, all the sort of piping and stuff, um, very brightly lit, very uh, relatively clean engine room, I thought, as these things go. Yeah. So it's a nice looking engine room. Yeah. The sister ship is actually cleaner, apparently. Ah, okay. <laughs> they've had yeah. more time underway um, in the past few years, which means they've had a full crew to, to do painting and cleaning and deep cleaning and such. Yeah, it's sort of funny in its own way that, that more use means cleaner. Yeah. So, and here's some of the workshop modules I talked about. These are 20 foot Connex boxes, um, not the 40 foot. So 20 foot is what they originally sort of came up with. And then the world is kind of standard standardized on 40 foot, but 40 foot with an asterisk because there's 44 foot and there's super talls or whatever they call them and this and that and the other yeah. thing. If you, if, if you only remember one thing, it's probably 20 foot equivalent units. Most of which are most containers are two TEUs these days. These are one TEU containers. And basically the idea is you build a workshop into a, into a container, you put it on this ship, and you can cross deck workshops and stuff. And you also bring parts and, and people can repair gear and, you know, pull something out of the helicopter, bring it down, fix it, take it back up, put it back in the helicopter. The helicopter flies away. Yeah. 
and you can see this is at the very bottom of the ship and and that's why they have all those uh those mounting brackets because you know th those floors don't move this is the bottom right that's actually the middle okay i stand corrected yeah. do they just um put those there to um give them a locking point then yes yes so all that stuff can come up it could yes yeah, I don't know how. I never really looked to see how it's can, it's done. This is the, this is the lowest cargo for that specific section of the ship. There's an engineering space below it. Okay, okay. Yeah. So, so you're not gonna you're not gonna put cargo any lower because this is the lowest cargo deck for that one bay. Yeah. For that bay. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So that was the last slide. So let me turn that off and bring us all back up. So um, I see a lot of stuff there that 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 gets my, you know, I start thinking science fiction terms when I see stuff like that. So Sean, you know, you're you're new to this, you're relatively speaking. What was your thinking on this? Uh, I was just really interested to see the ship and to think about, you know, what kind of missions it would support, thinking of the US Navy and the Marine Corps. And if they were deploying marine aviation assets somewhere, you could bring this repair capacity along uh, sort of in a modular way and say, well, depending on what kind of helicopters I'm going to operate where I bring this stuff and I've got more capacity to do it. And there are a lot of support ships like this that you don't usually think about that go yeah. with, uh, you know, amphibious operations and Navy deployments. And it's not just the, the combat ships that you do think of or even the even the amphibs, it's it's you know all these other ships that come along, and like so when we're going to go somewhere. We bring a lot of ships, a lot of people, and a lot of stuff, and then this that just re you know seeing the ship just reinforced that. Yeah, and at some level, it's like okay, do they do they need it, right? Well, no, from the standpoint that if they actually you know they've got amphibs right so and they've right. got aviation uh, repair guys on the amphibs so in theory they don't need it but you know having excess capacity is always a good thing good you know and yep. let that helicopter uh sit you know let's go ahead and get it fixed um it would not surprise me if that a lot of the stuff that they end up doing on board this ship would be sort of the more routine maintenance sort of stuff um now note for the record helicopters and routine maintenance helicopters <laughs> require a lot of maintenance and cycling that maintenance is something that they spend a lot of time thinking about in the composite warfare commander system that the u.s navy uses there's a guy known as the heck the helo element coordinator and one of his jobs is, I mean, his main job is to make sure that whenever a warfare commander needs a helicopter, that there's a helicopter available for him. And that includes stuff like paying attention to what the maintenance cycles look like on all the different ships so that he can go and say, hey, I know that you guys aren't due to bring that helicopter down to, for maintenance for another hundred hours. Go ahead and pull it now. Go 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 ahead and do the fifty thousand mile checkup now, because you guys are also synced up with these guys, and we don't want you both to go down at a time. So go ahead and do that guy's maintenance early. And so he's responsible for coordinating the schedule of both ops, but also things like maintenance, and having an extra ship available that you can that you can do maintenance stuff on and, and fix gear and stuff like that is a big deal. And it was interesting to me, it seemed to provide a flexible capability because you, the ship was not tied to, this is, this is in addition to what you would have with the amphibs. And so if you're doing, you know, an operation in one place where you need more maintenance capacity, you can bring the ship. And if you're not, you don't need to bring it. I think we saw when we were looking at the ship's deployment history that it was in the uh, uh, in the Gulf for three months in uh, 2003. Peter, is that right? I believe so. It was also off uh, off also off New York City after Hurricane Sandy. You know, yeah. just interesting that you have something like that. You, you can you know send it where you need it, leave it there as long as you need it, and then bring it out to you know to send somewhere else. 
And it's also useful. It's useful just to have another pad. I mean, sometimes when you're moving stuff around, sometimes the question is, you know, they talk about lily pads and the idea is you hop from pad to pad, right? Because you you can only go so far in a helicopter before you need to need to to get some fuel and stuff like that. Yeah. So, another, uh, another possible advantage is, and I don't know how you load how you if if you can move helicopters down into the cargo holds. I, I I've never seen it in operation. Um. You could use it as a ferry, you know. Yeah. Put stuff, load a bunch of stuff on board. You send this ship back to intermediate area to offload instead yeah. of having to pull your amphib out, which may be supporting not just a helicopter deck with a lot of ammo on it and a lot of Marines to run it and things like that, but also a huge command and control center. You know. Yeah, that that sort of reminds me of. Remember that one ship captain that always would come out and talk to Jean Luc. Um, he was he was flying an Excelsior, and it was clear that his job was to support the Enterprise. Right, the Enterprise is a frontline ship out doing frontline ship stuff, and there was this guy just sort of plugging along, doing personnel runs and bringing stuff, and he maybe had a couple of other ships and just did a little circuit. And he showed up like three or four times to just, you know, sort of bring a guy to Jean-Luc or uh, bring him orders that they didn't want to transmit or whatever. And so um, it makes a lot of sense to have some excess, you know, you don't want to tie up uh, really expensive warships, high-end capacity warships for 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 missions like that. Yeah. Um, so uh, Brant Guillory says, you're not issued a helicopter, you adopt a helicopter. And I kind of like that. Yeah. Now, Br Brandt is a former tanker, um, a U.S. Army tanker. So um, um, I I don't recall that tanks were exactly known for their uh, for their lack of required maintenance or anything either. So, um, but uh, but I do know that helicopters make tanks look like they're pretty much you know wooden rounds off the shelf, no maintenance required. <laughs> so, yeah. all right, so. So um, I we're at the uh, uh, 28 minutes beyond where we theoretically, where we insist on saying this is an hour long show. I think we've done one show ever in the history of the show that lasted only an hour. Um, we've gone, this is not the longest we've gone. Let's not set a record. Uh, I can't see, let me scroll down to see. Oh, Lissa doesn't have her picture showing, but my guess is she would probably be, be cheering uh, <laughs> Thank you. There's a baby. So, so um, any final thoughts from anybody? Uh, this was a lot of fun. Uh, I, I enjoyed it. Learned a lot. It was uh, it was fun. Yeah, it was a great time. Okay, so I look forward to doing this again. We need to talk about the Wisconsin. Um, I spent, uh, as I was telling uh, uh, Peter and Sean before we came on. I spent some time today sort of pulling together my Wisconsin stuff also, including uh, some of the nifty things about how firing the firing circuit stuff works. Um, one of the things that I never truly appreciated about, about those ships, I'd, I'd go through the space and I'd see this wall of switches and not and just sort of thought, oh, circuit breakers or something like that. But it's no, it's, it's basically it's how you program the system. And by program, I mean, you've got three 16 inch turrets, and 10 five inch turrets and six fire directors and a couple of radars and a couple of CICs. And you need to make sure that the information follows the path. Which path? Well, whichever path you want it to. <laughs> and you do that by setting a bunch of switches. So we'll talk about that next time. So with that in mind, I think we're ready to call it a night. And so thank you very much, everybody. Live long and prosper. See you next time.